While many members of the FOMC are leaning towards lowering rates, the president of the Cleveland Fed, Loretta Mester, has laid out the argument against a cut this month. Well, we're very pleased to welcome Loretta Mester to the program. So thank you for joining us here in London. Thank what you for having me. What kind of data do you need to see in order to say, okay, let's go, let's cut? Yeah, so I think we're in this position where we're trying to assess whether growth is slowing to trend or whether there's some more significant slowdown going on. So me personally, I would like to see more data on the business side because as we know, business investment has been weak. I'd like to see a couple more employment reports so that we get a sense of whether last month's report was uh, weaker but is going to come back up or whether we're going to have a continuation of uh, employment growth slowing more than expected. I'd like to see some more readings on inflation expectations because as you know, the last two readings from some survey um, data has, has, has gone down, but the levels still seem about where they've been over the last couple of years. So I'd like to see a little more data on that side. Mm -hmm. The consumer side of the U.S. economy has held out pretty well. So again, if you saw that deteriorating, then that would be a, a, a red flag as well. So again, I think you know, there's a possibility that growth could be slowing more than we expected. Of course, we did expect some slowing this year to trend. Is it slowing more? I need to see more evidence. If the Fed cuts rates at the next meeting, would you worry that actually the markets are dictating what the Fed should do? No, I, I don't worry about that because I know how the Fed works. And, and all of my colleagues you know, go into the meetings really assessing a whole panoply of data. We don't dis, you know, discount what's going on in financial markets, obviously, because you know, financial conditions are an important factor in assessing where the economy is going. But we look at many, many factors and some of the data, real side data, and also the, the information we get from our business contacts and our consumer contacts. That's very helpful in times where you're trying to be forward looking and looking where the economy is going. Well, an important conversation with Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed out of Bernard, Math Bernard Mathematics in Princeton. And of course, we welcome all of you on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio Worldwide. This, uh, uh, President Mester, this conversation was important 24 hours ago. It is ever more important right now. The new phrase early July is liquidity trap. You know this from Krugman 1998 at Princeton. Okay, great at MIT. Are we heading towards a global liquidity trap? You know, I don't think that's how I characterize things. I think we're all trying to assess where economies are going. We know that growth abroad outside of the U.S. has been slowing, and that's one of the factors that affects the U.S outlook as well because there are linkages through financial markets, something that you're pointing out, and also through trade, trade channels. And the uncertainty around trade policy has been a factor in, in clouding the outlook. Um, I think the slowdown in global growth, including China, but also Europe, has been a factor affecting um, the U.S. Um, economy. So these are things that we're keeping an eye on. But again, when we think about monetary policy in the U.S., we're thinking about how the economy in the U.S. is going to be doing over time and then calibrating our policy towards that. One, one of the risks, including my recent conversation with the vice chairman, was the idea of goods deflation and global disinflation folding up into the normal inflation of the service sector. Do you see data now, or is there a risk that this drag on the global economy will actually pull down service sector inflation in America? I think we have to keep an eye on the inflation data and the inflation expectations data. Right now, my forecast as the most likely outcome is that inflation will move gradually back to 2%. The early um, this year data that was softer means it'll take a bit longer to do that. But right now, I still have that as my most likely outcome. However, you do have to think about the underlying trend in inflation. Some of it's cyclical, that factors affecting inflation, but also some of the structural factors, things like um, you know businesses, you know, with new models of how they're competing with one another, price setting behavior, consumer search behavior, and those structural factors are probably weighing on inflation as well. Can you still say, Mrs. Mester, that the Fed fund rates is below neutral? So I think the Fed funds rate is about at neutral right now, um, but as the economy dictates where the equilibrium rate is, we need to move our rate with it. So for example, if it is true, right, then instead of us being in a sustainable growth scenario, 
we are entering a new phase where it's a weak growth scenario, then the equilibrium interest rate in the economy will move down, and that would be one reason to move our policy rate down. But again, I don't think I have enough evidence to suggest that things are necessarily going there. I want to see a little more evidence before we get to that point. You were talking there about some of your business contacts as well. What have they been telling you about investment and hiring, and is it linked to, the, to you know, the trade tensions or to something else? Right. Businesses in our district, and of course we're more uh, representative of manufacturing than other parts of the country, trade is definitely a concern. The trade policy uncertainty about it is definitely rising in terms of their concern. However, most of them, and still the majority of them, say we haven't changed our investment plans. We're still on track with what we plan to do. There are a few now that are saying I may be rethinking that or trying to reassess it, but so far they've held in there. Some firms have already reorganized their supply chains, um, but others are just taking it in stride and just saying, I wish the uncertainty well, were over so I would know where things were going, but I'm still on plan. Uh, President Mester, I want to go back to first principles here. Michael McKee would suggest that we go right back to Econ 101 uh, with Loretta Mester. Let's do that. Is a tariff just an import tax on the businesses of your Cleveland district? So I don't view it like that because some of it, there's deadweight costs to having imposing tariffs, of course. If you reorganize your supply chain to get away from the tariff and you happen to reorganize it in a way that is not as efficient, then that's a deadweight loss. You're not collecting right. the tariff and you're not also being efficient in how you've organized your supply. So tariffs are a tax, if you will either on the business who has to absorb it in their margin or they pa try to pass it on to consumers in terms of their prices. So we'd like to get to a point where we have free trade. Of course, it's got to be fair trade as well. And so I think part of the thing that our firms are telling us is that it's the uncertainty around where tariff policy is going, where trade policy is going, that creates um, some problem for them as they plan out what they want to be doing with their businesses. Yeah, but is a deadweight loss spelled H-A-N-O-I? I mean, is the basic idea here is China will just move out any trade upset to Vietnam? I mean, the simplistic nature of a mercantile president is extraordinary. You're in the absolute heart of what America has to deal with with this trade war. How would you recommend that the Fed assist us through President Trump's trade war. Okay, so we have to take as given policies that are outside of the realm of monetary policy. That's part of the economic environment we're living in. The uncertainty created by some of the, the policies and changes in policies, we have to take that as perhaps a headwind <laughs> to growth and therefore think about our monetary policy in that concept. We're not in a position to give advice on you know, to the president about his policies. He's obviously pursuing policies that he thinks are the correct policies. As a monetary policymaker, we take them as part of the economic environment and then assess where we think the economy is going and how to calibrate our policy to it. Is finding qualified workers still the number one concern for U.S. employers? Certainly in our district it is. And if you look at the NFIB survey of small businesses, that is the number one uh, problem that they're facing across the board, all types of firms, all types of occupations. It's not just, you know, high wage occupations, it's also low wage occupations. Number one thing that they tell us our businesses is that we can't find qualified workers. Um, Loretta Mester, President Trump has picked two Fed nominees that are likely to support easier policy. Do you worry about the, the politicization of it all? Well, politicization of the Fed in terms of trying to influence uh, monetary policy is something that we all are concerned about. I have no reason to believe that the two nominees or prospective nominees are going to make it more, more political, less political. The Fed works, right, in an apolitical manner. I can tell you I've been going to FOMC meetings since the end of 2000, and at every, every meeting that we've been to, we never talk politics. It doesn't enter the room. We really are trying to assess economic data, financial data, anecdotal evidence, modeling, et cetera, to know where is the economy going as best as we can and to calibrate our policy to right. it. But certainly we don't want to have short-run political 
um, factors right. influencing monetary policy. President Mester, we've got a firm surveillance rule. We don't do mathematics in August, but we do do it in July, <laughs> and we're going there right now. Michael McKee and I, our, our Craig Torres and all, agree that Fed policy of desiring to get to 2% over seven years, eight years, nine years, has been a colossal failure. Are you at a research point yet with the leadership of the Cleveland Fed on inflation where we need to bring down that 2% benchmark to something new for a new terminal value in America? So as, you're, as you point out, we do have an uh, inflation research center that we established at the Cleveland Fed. We're looking at all aspects of inflation to better understand inflation dynamics. It's interesting that you say, should we bring down the target? Because the counter argument is some people have suggested we should raise a target. So that gives us more chance of staying right. away from the Fair. zero lower bound. So I think <clears throat> what that suggests is that there is no one answer. As I said earlier, there are structural factors that are affecting inflation going forward. But that just means that the monetary factors are probably going to take a little bit longer term than it would have in the past. So again, I still think my forecast still is that the most likely path will be inflation right. gradually rising to 2 percent. But certainly we need to understand more about inflation dynamics. President Mester, I don't want you to, get you to get in trouble with Jerome Powell today. Mike McKee fed me this question, so you can blame him. At the ECB, they've had the advantage of Otmar Issing of Germany. Right now they have Philip Lane, the acclaimed, Philip Lane, the acclaimed academic of Ireland. How much help is Madame Lagarde going to need from your world to do a great job in Frankfurt? How, how does she bring in the economics to advance forward the decision? Decision making. Well, the ECB is a, a wonderful institution that has very strong economists. Christine Lagarde is a very strong uh, international credentials. Um, I think that she's going to do quite well. I think she's going to be open to investigating all aspects of the economy so that she can set monetary policy in Europe. And I, I think that she's going to do a fine job. She has a good staff at the ECB to help her as needed. Is it odd that, that you have two ex-lawyers heading you know, the, the two biggest central banks in the world? I think it's an interesting case where you can bring in different aspects. One of the things about the Federal Reserve that I think is very strong is that we have different backgrounds and yeah. diverse views around that table. We have a very strong staff at the Reserve Banks, and we have a very strong staff at the Board of Governors. And I think that makes for a better policymaking right. environment. So I, same thing in Europe, I would say. This has been a great interview. Francine's asking all the rude questions this time about lawyers uh, at the <laughs> Fed. Let me ask you about the great dissenter. I mean, I know Cleveland Indian St. Louis Cardinals is a great thing. <laughs> Bullard and regime change. Do you buy as a mathematician the idea on the x-axis that you get to a regime change, or is it going to be a continuous function fed out into the future? So there's a lot of uh, models that suggest that you can have two kinds of equilibrium and you can switch from one to another. Again, great, in, great research questions. Um, we know that when you get towards a zero lower bound, the economy can act differently than when it's away. So that's a fine theory. Um, and we have to take those kinds of models into account when we're setting monetary policy. So I, I, you know, I have no problem with, with Jim you know, having that view of the world. I, I personally think we're not near that equilibrium, but we'll have to remain open to seeing how the economy develops going forward. Is there one thing that economists actually misunderstand? about the world economy? Uh, there's probably many things we misunderstand but because the one that it's, we're always, it's always a research question. There's always a lot to research. I think we're trying to do the best given our models, given our data, given our anecdotal evidence that we gather from business con contacts. We're always trying to pursue the same goals. That's, I can say that unequivocally about the Federal Reserve participants. We're always fo focused on the same goals. We might have different <clears throat> views about what's appropriate to get there.